it, it, is, um, it is a talk which I did at a conference, which is a, quite a big conference of 200 professionals, which Rao was uh, there as well. Uh, Rao approached me and said, oh, can we do this? And it's been, that was about like nearly two years ago. Uh, and here we are in terms of trying to kind of do similar things. I've since talked about this uh, at a couple of other professional groups, uh, and that, that has kind of generated quite fascinating discussions within our professional body. I'm really, really kind of looking forward to have your views about this as well. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, my name is Ravi, Ravi Tiagaraj. Most people call me Ravi, or Dr. Ravi, because my surname's a tongue twister. <laughs> 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 um, um, I am um, primarily my um, work is across Hampshire, works in different teams across Hampshire. Currently, I'm based in Farrell Gospel, which is kind of a Portsmouth, Portsmouth way. Um, and we have a significantly high levels of neurodevelopmental uh, sort of okay, case load. Um, so, um, uh, and, and that is where I kind of started to have a lot of interest in terms of thinking about setting up neurodevelopmental disorders, AD, ADHD, autism, and other things. Uh, and I, I also have a bit of uh, private practice interest, which is very circumscribed, which focused on Beedales, which is a school in Petersfield area. Um, uh, and that, that's kind of pretty much it. Most people know a little bit about me in Hampshire, but I guess actually I'm completely new face in here. I'm not an academic, I'm not a researcher, I'm primarily a clinician. Hence, the reason I'm saying that is this topic is something, it's been researched, but very little. It is there in every child who has ADHD, but it is absolutely at the bottom of the agenda when it comes to treatment. It is something which actually influences the outcome of treatment quite a lot, but predominantly kind of pushed away in terms of management, particularly whether it's medical management or psychological treatment or other things. So the, 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 the origination of this kind of thinking is really of self-reflection of actually the number of that comes through clearly presenting with issues. But that is it in terms of thinking about if it is engagement with treatment, education, or compliance with medication, or other issues, what influences outcomes. So it started off as a self-reflection, and here we are. So it's a mixture of psychological concepts, some scientific or uh, biological basic by background, uh, some philosophical as well, really. Uh, but it really thinking about in terms of uh, how the evidence lies and how we can actually think about how more importantly to generate a discussion amongst ourselves and not lose sight of a very, very important issue that should be going through. So yeah, so, so the, the origins are here. But a child who is diagnosed with ADHD, the general perceptions in the head is that, oh, everybody thinks I'm stupid, or I am stupid. Everybody thinks I'm lazy, I'm dumb, bad, or naughty child, and all of those things. They probably have gone through that even before they got to the diagnosis point, where people identify that are actually issues with a child who's considered as a, a clown of the classroom, or naughty child, or child not performing well, and all of those things. And in their head, these are exactly what they actually said to me in my clinics as well. They didn't say, well, I have to take day tablets so that I won't be bad, so that I will stop being naughty. And I'm sure you may have heard some of those little statements what I'm going to say as well. And in terms of saying, I think I'm doing really well. I really try hard. But it doesn't turn out very well, and it just makes me upset. And I, I feel probably I'm stupid. I'm slow. I can't do things as well. And it's quite a contradiction in some ways because they are very bouncy, they're all, around, all over the place. But when it comes to the task, the expectations on them, they are slow to complete it. Um, and likewise, I get frustrated. It's, it's really making me sad. It's just because everybody thinks I can't do it as well as I do, so I, I must be lazy. So there are quite a few things which you kind of on the surface, clearly, you can see that a child would go through in their thinking, in their connection, in the way how they perceive themselves after they've gone through the journey of clinical diagnosis and treatment. And despite that, there are certain issues. So, my thinking was how do we kind of explore this? Uh, and the first thing was going back to my roots in terms of psychology. So, if you look at it, there are quite a few things we can think about. First, Thinking about psychosocial development in terms of we all grow up from a child who have got 
lots of different kind of um, some this is where the nature nurture debate happens. We start with a blank slate, a blank slate, how 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 environment influences us. But Eric Erickson is quite a fascinating psychologist actually, created a theory of psychology, psychosocial development. He started off saying that different at different ages when we go through, we have a conflict in our head. And how the conflict then plays out in terms of how we then develop our own characteristics, our own attitude towards things, our personality, our reaction to it. So he started off talking about infancy, in the first two years of life, where there is a bit of the conflict about trust and mistrust and thinking about, well, whether uh, my caregiver, my mother, my father, can they provide me with reliable care and attention? And what happens during this time then influences the way how they develop, how they develop a view of the world or the relationship in, in relationship with the world around them. And it kind of moves on in terms of the terrible twos, the autonomy was there, where they become try to become more independent, try to take control, and then and then that then actually then uh, uh, shapes them in terms of how they then deal with life in general. But the most crucial that I want to kind of bring attention to is that bit. If you look at that, the, the, what Erickson's proposal was actually <coughs> in the <stress. coughs> Reality is the conflict, and that is when they join and start school, and this, that's when there is the expectation, the demand on the good terms of <coughs> academia, uh, learning, or social ex expectations. And at that time, if they are impaired in whatever way, what that leads to that kind of sense that actually I can do things, but I can't. I am good enough. I'm not, in a sense. And that is the crucial phase. And if you look at the vast majority of the children, although they may get diagnosed at lots and lots of different times, but it comes down to that place where actually until then they had this safety of the nursery, a safety of the home, and generally kind of muddle along with the siblings and carry on with their life. And then they get into this place where their impairment becomes really apparent compared to their peers. And then the perception of themselves and how the self-esteem issues then potentially can develop. And I, I looked at that theory and it kind of made sense to me. I hope it actually kind of makes sense to you. But Erickson goes on to describe in terms of our our, our own cycle psychosocial development after that. I mean it goes on into other two things. But that place is where I think <coughs> it comes up for our relevance to us. Um, relevance to us and in terms of understanding the core uh, uh, problems which might actually start, at what point they start to become a bigger issue in the long run. And that is the psychological aspect of it. But then I thought actually that should be something else. You can't just kind of explain about it because I, even now, as much as it may make common sense, biology doesn't explain it. In terms of the psychological theory, there is no way we are able to kind of prove our biological theories. So I then I kind of started looking about, okay, what does the biology say? About self esteem. And this is a study, uh, this is a study they uh, were done uh, in America a few years ago. And it, it claimed that actually they found a place where they can actually d determine self esteem, which is quite fascinating. I looked into it. And what, what they're talking about, it's uh, they did two things. One, they looked at the structure of the brain and then the function of the brain, the kind of the connect, the, the moon, the electrical impulses, or Transmitters how they how they move around the brain. When looked at the structure of the brain and then related to people's perception of their own self by like questionnaires and assessments and interviews, they found a couple of things: the the structural integrity of that particular pathway, the frontostriatal pathway, which is quite a crucial pathway in a many many mental health disorders and illnesses. And they looked at it and they found actually. If the structural integrity is not good enough, people have poor self-esteem. Um, and or if the flow in between those connections from the frontal to the striatum at the back of the brain, if the flow is not good enough, then it can cause poor self-esteem. The way how we explain it actually, um, it, it kind of goes into a lot of a lot of different things. I kind of explain it in a simple way, which the which the paper points to as well. State versus trait. Tra trait. So trait is how we are, what we are. That is kind of biology aspect of it. 
So if you take this frontostriatal pathway as a like a tube, and if the tube is strong enough, good enough, big enough, then it kind of lets things flow quite smoothly, which means that it's not going to be a major issue. But if the tube is narrower, then it restricts the flow, potentially causing issues. That is the structural aspect of it, and that is effectively isn't going to change. However, the diameter of the tube alone doesn't matter. There is the flow. If you kind of go into the physics of it, if, the law, if you look at the velocity of the things, what is going through the speed of it, and the strength of it, the pressure, all of those things determines in terms of how things move. So if you look at the flow, which is what the state of it. So even if we have very poor self-esteem as and actually structural integrity is not brilliant, if the flow is brilliant, we can get away with them, at least at times. And, and, and hence, it, this kind of highlights one, that is the importance of frontostriatal part of self-esteem. And then, in terms of there is still value in our attempts to make the flow better to actually get the self-esteem to improve. So it's not like, oh, that is it. You've got yes, narrower diameter to you as a result of your self-esteem. is always going to be like that. So no, that's not what we kind of want to kind of focus on the reality. There is two elements here. One is the structure of it, and then it is the function of it. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because, what, how is it relevant to ADHD? It's because of that. If you look at ADHD, and in terms of vast number of, I'm sure you have had uh, Prof. Katya Rubia coming and presenting at some point as well, who talks about quite a lot about brain scans and ADHD and other things. And if you look at that, if you're looking at what does the brain, potential brain aspect which could be associated with children with executive function difficulties and ADHD and other things, and then the focus again is structural integrity of the frontostriatal pathway, and then, uh, and then the um, say that and also the way of it flows, matter flows between the, in between the frontostriatal kind of circuits. So there, again, you kind of start to wonder, also, <coughs> where the child's developmentally impairments are identified and how, at what point the self-esteem then develops, that is the psychological way of associating ADSD and potentially for genes having poor self-esteem. And there is this biological theory of Frontostriatal <coughs> pathway, social integrity issues, as well as the functional aspect of it, and that is that correlation there. So it kind of starting to make me wonder how much, if that is the case, how clearly it is relevant for us to kind of look at self-esteem as a real associated issue with children who present with ADHD. And then, the, well, the, the, the kind of the psychiatrists in the end, as well as the kind of, because we all work as a multidisciplinary team, and we kind of think there's always, there is one, there are at least one person in the team who will say, hang on a second, to kind of create a balance. ADHD is still, it's a social construct, it's very abstract, it's arbitrary diagnostic principles, it's nothing that exists in ADHD kind of argument. And that, you moved on massively so, because when I started in child analysis mental health about 15 years ago, there's quite a significant proportion of people who will have a debate about, look, is this related to the social psychosocial aspects of the child, or is it kind of related to the biological aspect? But the biological argument pretty much has won over over the years. So the, the, that narrative and rhetoric is actually kind of a smaller, but still, there is going to be some influence because we can't necessarily make completely rule out the possibility of the influence of when we're on a child's not necessarily primarily ADHD symptoms, but certainly the effect it can have on self-esteem. So, if you simply put, this is a child, at least until the point of, of diagnosis, sometimes even after diagnosis, there is a scrutiny of the teacher, of educators who kind of say, oh, come on, you got to have this, or you have to do this this way, or even the supportive mechanisms of actually trying to, oh, well, you need extra support, come and sit in front of the classroom. And that still is, from the child's perspective, negative attention. And the negative attention is, kind of goes across both peer mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. It's a mixed thing. It's actually, some, some children enjoy the identity of being the class clown. 
but not necessarily benefit from it themselves or actually to the classroom. Uh, and that, that kind of has a similar influence in terms of the child's perception about themselves, and the perception about themselves. And then me, who sits there in the clinic, invites them for these meetings from time to time, thinking about, uh, thinking about oh, well, how is this get And in, in vain, yeah, well, it, it is inevitable, isn't it? In terms of when you come to a clinic, you are there to kind of talk about issues. And, uh, and I generally tend quite a bit of time with a child first before I absolutely, completely ignore the pattern, just to try and encourage them to kind of think about what has gone well. And then when we kind of move on, we are there to resolve problems and kind of emphasize that actually he is here, we are here to kind of resolve problems to help you. And, uh, really. So that's where actually in terms of that scrutiny came, the perception of that scrutiny, patterns of course. None of us consciously want to kind of deal oh God, you're doing this and that. We all kind of do it from time to time. And, uh, but the, rea the reality of it, a combination of all these factors certainly will influence a child's own development of the positive self or the negative self esteem. So Carl Rogers puts it really well in terms of self worth and positive regard. As driven parents, the vast majority of them, or the vast majority of us, we kind of say, Oh, you got all A's and yeah. but how come you miss that bit? Because I had this. Uh, it's only it's time of the year we all get the school reports, and my my older girl is in year, year seven, and she came and said, "Oh, my Spanish teacher said this, and my Latin teacher said this, and Mum goes straight away. How come you get A two and that? Okay, why? And and, and she kind of husband <laughs> said, "I walk in. They're both upset, arguing, and I said, "Oh." Uh, what's it? Oh, what, what happened? Why are you upset? Oh, was the result of those 12 months, the grades, and other things? I said, um, I said, okay, well, what happened? I got A1 in these days and A2 in these. Oh, very good. See, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what it said. <laughs> <laughs> so then I started, that's different. But, but, but naturally, naturally, the reality is we want the reward of our children of good behavior or of their achievements and provide consequences for their negative behavior. Um, but, but if you look at children with ADHD, unfortunately, because of their impairments, they have the higher likelihood of getting more negative consequences. Until we are able to, uh, he, uh, he or she recognizes there are, uh, there are a different ways of how I am managing life in terms of making choices. And as a result, this leads to negative consequences for me. How can I then modulate my choice? Until they get to that insightful point, they are going to face more negative consequences than most children do. And that then actually has an influence in terms of how they develop as a person or an individual in terms of thinking about self-worth, their own self, and things like that. So that is kind of broadly the psychological, biological theories I was trying to explore. Uh, as I said, it, it, quite a lot of my colleagues who sit there and kind of talk about, listen to this, are, oh, Ravi, but that, that I don't really am sure because I see in my clinic a vast number of ADHD children have really high self esteem. And I say, oh, Connors, how do you say that? That, that happens. Tell, explain to me. The way, oh, they come in, they are the most popular kid in the classroom, they do all of these things, they go out and they do this and they do that and everything. But, but can we kind of describe in terms of what happens? And th those are the children, then you kind of go deeper, then they say, well, this is a child who goes and kind of sadly use substances or he much into kind of very easily go into smoking or things like that. And you kind of start, oh, why is this child doing it? And if you look at the evidence, if you look at the clinical basis of it, there is quite a bit of evidence in terms of coming through, which is what is what is absolutely going to be crucial for us in terms of thinking about what is in real practice, how does it present? And if you look at this chart, what is that one symptom which presents in children of that age? It's core symptoms of ADHD. Before <laughs> the other things start to kind of uh, become uh, explode or demonstrated by the child, low self-esteem is that one co-associated presentation at a very young age. And then it's other other things start to develop that dis disturb disruptive behavior, social skills issues, 
positional defiance, challenging behavior, criminal behaviors, school issues, or substance abuse. All of those things start to kind of expand in terms of thinking about. So the child doesn't present with all of these things there. Self-esteem is there. And it just starts to kind of expand into the child when the child gets older and into adulthood. And, and that is a crucial aspect which we want to go back and reflect on and how important it is to kind of really identify it early and to target that, so that issue when at a very early stage so that we can try and prevent or avoid some of these. And that's another slide to kind of indicate in terms of the comparison between children who are uh, the normal population and then compared to the children who are uh, with ADHD and family associated issues. And across board, the impact of ADHD is phenomenal, really. So, so how do I kind of go there? In terms of, if you look at it, that poor self esteem aspect is consistently reported by people. And, and, and consistently reported when we ask about it. It's not something which naturally comes up in our conversation because very often we go, okay, how are you getting on at school? Oh, are you getting into trouble? Oh, is the medication works? Are you eating okay? There is no space in our clinics nowadays or professionals nowadays to start thinking about how are you, how are you finding yourself? How are you, what, what is your view about yourself? And what, what is going on in your head in terms of going through this journey with us? And children with ADHD are the ones who are going to have more internalizing and externalizing issues. What I mean by that, we are going to compare the children who has got ADHD and compare the children who has got a bigger problem with self-esteem and compare the children who may have lesser problem with self-esteem. The children with ADHD who has got the bigger problem with self-esteem are more likely to present with internalizing, internalizing behaviors and attributes such as depressive, anxiety, on thinking about self-harm and all of those things and externalizing the thing of the boisterousness, the conduct problems, the positionality, disengagement for education, all of those things. So, so they are the ones who present with significantly higher complexities compared to the children who have got slightly better self-esteem. So that is important to kind of think about. Um, and again, smoking and double substance misuse issues. And, and it, it clearly, these are children who then actually start to have this negative of themselves and want to create, find, a, find, an, find an identity. And that's when they are the ones who are much, much more vulnerable to be goaded into, dragged into some slippery slope. It's not the conscious decision, oh, I like smoking, we can go and do it. And these are the children <coughs> more likely though, they want to kind of prove to people they can achieve certain things. And then the peer pressure then becomes much, much more easier to be getting out of into one of those aspects. And that is kind of pretty much common sense in terms of children with self-esteem are more likely to have issues with depression and anxiety. And also, that is what actually triggered my whole kind of think about this actually. Children who are diagnosed quite early, who haven't had the chance to actually explore themselves about the diagnosis and the impairments and have a poor, uh, don't have a better understanding of their issues are the ones who kind of develop into a place where absolutely hate taking the medicine. That gives me a completely different identity. Don't want to take it, I forget it, or miss it, or all of those things have started to happen. And generally, that is often seen about the 13, 14 years of age. And that is partly one of the reasons, if you look at the current numbers which comes across the children who are transitioning to adult mental health, 96% of the children don't take the medicine into adult. However, if you look at the Hampshire, that is now a has got a Hampshire adult ADHD assessment service, the pre prevalence as in an adult population of ADHD is very similar to children. However, the children who are diagnosed at their childhood choose not to take the medication. <laughs> Which is quite a fascinating thing in terms of thinking about how this is kind of developing in their mind as identity and choosing not to take the medication. A small proportion of them come back to me, say, oh, well, as soon as they finish GCSC, they say, oh, well, Ravi, I don't want to take my medication. I've been waiting for this time for such a long time. I don't have to listen to my parents anymore legally. I don't have to stop taking medication. I said, no. 
think carefully about this, young man, because if you choose not to, and if I discharge you, and if you come back at age of 19 begging for it, it's about a year wait before mm -hmm. you even get into the air service. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if I transition you, you probably will get seen within nine months to a year, and you will still be open to being in compliance. So the, 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 the opportunity for them to have a conversation is crucial, but the reflection is actually, how did they get to that place where they don't want to do it? So, it, it, I just put the slide in terms of thinking about the characteristic of people. It's just uh, it generally, when we say, uh, me and Val were having a, a conversation earlier in terms of what, what is self-esteem and what determines self-esteem. And I'm thinking about, um, um, self-esteem is not associated in, in a lot of ways. Isn't it? It's not associated with uh, achievements and performance and outcomes because there will be someone who has got uh, a fabulous job and uh, financially very stable, economically very stable, professionally very stable, but will not regard themselves as uh, achieved or positive in a positive mindset, they may have a poor self esteem. On the other hand, somebody who hasn't achieved academically or hasn't achieved economically may have such a better self esteem. Um, or you can compare it with uh, the kind of the peers we have, the friends we have, uh, how, um, or your own body appearance. Some people who have got very, um, uh, very good looks may not have a good self esteem. On the other hand, some people may not may have a better self esteem. So what does this do really kind of determine, what determines the self-esteem? If you keep reflecting on the kind of the things what then uh, relates to in terms of our bringing up, the biology aspect of that, uh, it, it, it then gets a lot more complex. And, and the reason I wanted to reflect is actually one for us to kind of have a discussion about it later on, but also to think about the more we scratch it in terms of thinking about self-esteem as a co-associated issue, the more we know how complex it is. Um, but what we already know is that is one thing out of considering ADHD management, that is one thing can potentially influence the outcome of the child in the long run. So that is something which you need to really be mindful of in any stage. So what do we do? It's basically kind of, a lot of that is common sense in terms of what we do. But what I only will say is these are things which you will probably see in most of uh, um, um, advice in terms of um, ADHD children. And go to, uh, I'm sure in our in ADHD Richmond website as well, so there is similar kind of information in there. What I will only say is actually we've got to do a lot more of it. A really, really lot more of it. Not, in, not, not necessarily, not in a very um, uh, awkward and appropriate situation and they'll come in as, oh, I got excluded because I threw a chat at my teacher or something like that. <laughs> you don't say, oh yeah, well done now. <laughs> but, uh, in, uh, the key thing is in terms of even the smaller things that's kind of have to appreciate it more frequently and that is primarily to kind of explore the self-esteem. Uh, and if you think of their attention span, the children's attention span and their ability to retain information, you may immediately think actually, even if I, I may have praised the child, but they may not, not have got it. It may be useful, it will be useful to actually do it much, much more frequently and regularly. So, treatment implications. That's one thing which I'm, uh, um, uh, which kind of people start, oh, well, okay. Does treatment with our conventional management, as in medical management, which is predominantly what we generally use, is that has an impact on self-esteem. If you look at it, alongside all of those things, that is my kind of arena. And it absolutely does, because that's what the evidence actually say. Um, what the evidence say is, if I move through that one, what the evidence say? It certainly says, if we optimize and get the treatment right, it can influence the uh, effect, it will have an effect on, a, on the self-esteem because of the success it can achieve in terms of the core symptoms of ADHD. Uh, again, it's another data in terms of thinking about uh, what is the impact of the medication. These are, as I'm sure a lot of you will know, these are incredibly useful, extremely effective medication. Um, 
uh, if you look at the effect size of treatment for ADHD, particularly stimulants, is far higher than many, many other medicines within health, health science. If you take cardiac medicines, diabetic medicines, or uh, epilepsy medicines, or other mental health medication, stimulants have the biggest effect size. And the performance enhancing effect is it's clearly evidence they do work very, very well for children. Um, and in, in, in effect, it will work for all of us, really. Uh, for any one of us take the medicines, it will actually kind of help improve performance. But then why are we not fortifying flour or salt with various demons, which will actually improve the performance of the society in general, doesn't it? But it, of course, has the kind of the side effects aspect, because these are medicines which can contribute to certain tolerances you said, right? But the more crucial point is, the more higher the impairment, the bigger the benefit. So if I'm already performing at near optimum level, if I take the medication, it might still improve my performance, but it may not be worth it on the benefit risk balance. But if you take the children with impairment, such as a children who's diagnosed with ADHD, the benefits are far higher, means it almost nonsensical to even debate often about the usefulness of medication. So in, in, in my practice, I, I very much encourage families. I, um, the guidelines will say moderate to severe ADHD, think about medication, generally kind of go through behavior management. But if you look at the impact on the self-esteem, impact on the functioning levels, impact on the quality of life, it, I get it. it is your choice around the patterns. It is not necessarily, it's uh, got to be bound by guidelines. So they come in, have a similar session like this. I've got a two hours period of everything about medication. They pretty much go away, think about it, research about it with a child, and come back and say, oh, I fancy that medication. Would you consider that? And I go and say, well, it's really, oh, no, no, that's a, um, certain things which um, uh, associate here. <laughs> so uh, I, I generally go, the, if it is totally inappropriate, I go, oh, that would make me uncomfortable. But on the other hand, if they come over to the child, most of the families are, parents are, so yeah, let's give it a try and see whether the child is tolerated. Of course, the safety aspects come as a priority, tolerability comes as a priority before we even actually get to the, oh, is it working or not? But these children, these medicines are proven to be very effective in children with impairments. These, children, these, these children, medicines are proven to be well tolerated for by the vast majority of the children, so it's absolutely crucial. When we identify an impairment, the children need to be not denied of an opportunity to be able to function better. Mm -hmm. So, medicines definitely works, and, I've, uh, uh, and that's something which we can actually kind of uh, have a discussion further about it. Medicines do have an impact on associated issues as well, such as the positional defiance. Not all of it, simply because if choice behavior is a choice behavior, if a, if a child, any one of us can actually kind of say, oh, well, I know this is right, I know this is wrong, I know I'm going to get in big trouble if I do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and, and that's not bad, because that's our choice. And children often do that, rather than take, oh, I will be a good boy and will take the right choice. The vast majority of the children will always be tempted to make the wrong choice. Adolescents more so. That's not wrong. But what we can't expect is the medication to fix it. So that's, 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 the, that's the kind of, but it, if you look at the overall ability, if there is even the slightest chance that there is an impulsive nature of the child which then prompts the child to make a wrong choice, we may then have to think actually, we well, don't optimize the medication as long as they're tolerating it to achieve the best outcome. Um, we get into 40 minutes. Would people want to have a quick break? Because we are almost at the end of the presentation. We probably have 10 minutes, but we can actually go through the rest of the presentation and then generate questions if you want to have a break. Five minute toilet break. So no, just finish. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 So, 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 so uh, is there evidence? Is there real research evidence? Yes, there is research evidence that actually um, stimulants do improve self-esteem in children. And that's what's kind of highlighted in the previous slide. I was waiting for that to take the picture. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> just the references. Thanks. <laughs> right. Move on. So well, that's kind of that. So, so if you look at all ADHD medication or symptomatic solutions, 
So when you take the medicine, it works. When you stop the medicine, it doesn't work. That is the way how we understand it. And so if you look at the core symptoms of ADHD, is uh, the impulsivity, the hyperactivity, and the tension aspect of it, the medicines work incredibly well. When you take it, it works, and it comes out the system during the evening time, all of those things. But if you look at the long-term studies of children who are actually treated for a long period of time, it actually proves that actually children who are treated has got better outcomes in other aspects. For example, if, if the functioning levels are better and if the performance is better, they're going to have a better self-esteem even if they choose to discontinue the medication in the long run. And the other, aspect, other thing is actually the emerging, overwhelming evidence that's emerging from Scandinavian countries actually, in terms of the impact of, uh, positive impact of treating individuals who has got ADSD symptoms in the society. They have compared a huge volume of population study, thinking about um, um, uh, road traffic accidents, criminal behavior, um, uh, uh, sustaining with a job, uh, having a stable relationship, and all of those things. People who ex have exhibited symptoms of ADHD, when they are treated, they are less likely to have their bad, bad, effect, bad aspects in life, as in the criminal behavior or traffic accidents or um, job losses and things like that. So the if evidence is overwhelming. Uh, the the counter argument is actually the stu these studies are uh, driven hugely by pharmaceutical industry, but that is going to be a counter argument is always going to be there. But in actual practice as well, we do see children who benefit phenomenally from it. Again, crucial aspect as long as they're tolerating <coughs> it. Um, so the other aspect is in terms of current treatment focuses on the school day. Appropriately so, because stimulants, uh, uh, if it works, why can't we actually give 24 7? Mm -hmm. But then I've had a, a child who was started on a really potent stimulant recently, and consistently the child was sleeping only for two hours a night. Mm -hmm. Literally just two hours a night. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not like we are giving him in the evenings, we are giving him still in the morning. But the, but the child's reaction was that couldn't close his eyes. So we, we have to be really careful in terms of balancing it. But it is not inappropriate for us to consider, okay, the child's life is not just school life, the child's life extends beyond school life. Mm -hmm. How we actually kind of address and get the balance in terms of balance right. So how do we fine-tune the treatment to get it right? And what would be the most suitable medication choice? Hence the reason I, 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 I chose to give the options to the parent themselves because they know, I see them having been diagnosed through their pathway, they come in asking, oh, this medication is suitable for me. Now, probably it is, probably is. It's not necessarily, I can say, it, well, these are the evidence for stimulants, these are the evidence for non stimulant medication, not so great. However, if you want to go ahead, stimulants is what I would recommend, you go ahead, have a look and think, and out of those stimulant formulations, which I'm sure some of you are aware in terms of different things, how they work and what time of the day is more suitable, it's absolutely crucial to have some thought even before we actually kind of do it because in my, in my practice no medication, no child is on more than one medicine. It's simply because within the short, short, smallest of medication we can get things absolutely right if you're thoughtful in terms of getting the medicine, fainting the medicine to suit the child's uh, needs. Um, in terms of long-term outcome, it certainly kind of clearly proves that it is. So going back to the kind of the child, the next slide is something which I want you to see and forget because it's not what I said, right? Because I always ask the children to go back and Google for celebrities who has got dyslexia, ADHD, and all of those things. I am not really sure. The Google says this. It's not me. Uh, 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 so, so, uh, so I don't want to be <laughs> sued for defamation being a solicitor's office. <laughs> but, 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 but the reason I say that to the children is just it's absolutely crucial to develop that actually a diagnosis or being under treatment for a mental disorder, which is their perception of them, is doesn't equate to failure in life, and that is a crucial thing. And they have to kind of find a way to get that embedded in from a very young age. And I say, the moment they come in, even before they start the medicine, that's what I would say. Look, that's your homework for you. Go and have a look, research about it, and ask me. 
um, encouraging them to be involved in the treatment from a very young age as well will actually improve not only that kind of the uh, uh, taking ownership of the treatment, improves the concordance, and surely will have an impact on the self esteem of the child as well. So I'll finish with that. So we'll have a quick break. I'm happy for you to kind of, uh, I'm around for the next hour, so. Um, uh, Maybe a quick five-minute five break, break, and then we can regroup. Questions now, sir? Yeah.